We will pause recording. Well, generation, this should start if you don't already know. Start learning what we do and how we do it. But and you know, and I think sometimes they don't realize the importance. Yeah, I would, and Until I would. Until I'll be dead and gone. <laughs> well, that's the problem. Yeah, it, it's the it's the joke that I've heard it from many clergy <laughs> about the one young woman who was taught by her mom and her yeah, that you always you bring the prosvero and you bring a fakilo, the envelope to the priest, right? And the whole time she could bring in an envelope and it was empty, empty. and just saying, you know, here it is and here it is. And the priest said after like you know four or five times, like you know, why do you keep bringing me an empty envelope? It's because my mom and yeah told me I need to bring the prosvero to the fakilo. He's like, yeah, you're supposed to put names in the name in the vacuum. He, she's like, what? So yeah, we see, but because it wasn't uh, dictated and expressed that way, they don't know. I, I think, and I and I we've we've had this conversation, so that's why it goes back to what your original question was. So Orthodox Studies 101, when we do it on Wednesday nights, and it's every other. So one Wednesday, we do, we are talking on Romans. The fo the following Wednesday, we go to Orthodox Studies 101. It's sometimes the same group. You get different people. The reason why we did it was to offer something different. And I said it before, it was because even from our long-term planning committee and from our surveys, uh, I noticed it as well too. Bible study, the terminology is foreign to Greek Orthodox, especially Greeks. Uh, it, they, they put it in their mind, they compute it as something as Protestant. Uh, and unfortunately it's the complete opposite where it just shows how, with humility, with how uneducated people really are. Because if we actually participate in Bible study, we're learning and growing more in our faith. The problem is we think we know, but even the Greeks and non-Greeks and everyone else, we don't really know anything. It's all just, you know, how it was taught, hearsay, this and that, or whatever the case would be. And that's that's where it's at. And unfortunately, that is the poorness of our of our believers and faithful, because I say it with a lot of humility. If we have the one true faith, why are we so weakened? That's something we have to ask every single one of ourselves. And I'm preaching to the choir because I know all of you, and I've known you for many for quite a few years. You're the opposite, where you have this and obviously you participate. But then the question I then say is, and that's what happened with your first Orthodox Studies one, 101, was why don't we practice our faith? And then in turn, why don't our families and our children especially, and uh, you know, why don't they do it? And there's uh, there's always variables. There's always issues that come up and stuff like that. But one thing that I think that was obviously expressed was, you have to put everything in context. When all of you were raising families, and mind you, post World War II, naturally than yourselves being baby boomers and everything else, and going forward, you're raising families. You're trying to make a livelihood, um, trying to also plant your roots. You know, some of you have moved, some of you close, whatever the case would be. Trying to find that spiritual home, and then the clergy at the same time. Uh, it's nothing about me. I'm not educated. I'm not bright or whatever. But they, they were much simpler than what we are. Like me, I have to be an all-encompassing priest, both uh, spiritually and uh, and educationally and all these different things, while them, their focus was just to be there to serve and to minister, which has a lot of beauty and simplicity to it. But that teaching, that teaching was something that maybe it either wasn't present or, or I know it's going to get to the next point, or that it couldn't be expressed because maybe they only knew Greek, right? And most of us at that time, maybe first, second generation, even by then, only understood English, right? Then we didn't get it. And then that's why I tell people, it goes back to the, even the service as well too. I, I, I mean, we do services even in our church, I believe more than 60% in English, even on Sundays. And even our deacon, he does it all in English as well too. And I try to add in, but I'll add a few Greek here and there. I don't believe that if I did the entire service in English, that people would know how to participate or worship more fervently than if it was even in Greek, because what I then say is the faith circumvents language, because then if you go to any church, this is where you want to teach our families, you go to any church, Serbian, Russian, Romanian, Arabic, whatever the case would be, that wherever they're in the liturgy, you should kind of get an idea, so then you would still know how to do your prayer and still worship accordingly, where like, you know that they're about to do the gospel, okay, you get it, so you'd be standing, or they're about to do the cherubic hymn, you see them doing the great entrance. Those are stuff that every one of us does the exact same, right? That's an entrance, it's a reading. They might do it in different areas, whatever the case may be, but it's universal. So, but we don't know that. I mean, literally, unless they see the priest raise their hand or put their hand down, they don't know how to stand or sit. And I said, you don't have to sit. That's the other thing too. The sitting is just more for comfort, comfort right? 
I know that people stay up for two and a half hours longer. God bless them. Well, okay. they, oh, their churches, they didn't have any. Right, right. You guys didn't have pews. The old churches never did. The only pews that ever existed you ever see, like in Greece, were the side ones that are on the walls, the stasidia, those are the original ones. Yeah. And those were usually with respect for the elderly. My babu, I'm not, I'll never forget as a kid. I was in Tripoli one time. And if you want to know where your grandparents were or your parents, you had to know which stasis you were there. So in other words, it was like how the Jewish people, they um, they purchased their roads mm -hmm. or their pews, right, for their synagogue and high holidays. It's the same thing. Oh, no, nope, that's that's Christos. That says you don't sit there. Oh, okay, so you go to the next one. Nope, sorry, that's what's the names. So even if they're not there that day, you can't sit in. So I was like, that's his. So it was a so, pecking so, order. So, so funny that I remember where my papa was, and he had his friend next to him, the other one next to him. And they'd sit there, they'd listen. Okay, they prayed in their own manner, but they went, right? Okay, God bless them. Uh, but it was just so funny because I remember because then I would stand there, they knew that I was his grandson. Oh, okay, well, you're his family. It is. It's like the family one, right? So you can sit there and stand there. I was a little kid. What did I know? But uh, it's just so funny how they have it because then here, you know, we have all the comfort and everything that we need, but. Um, we just don't know. We just, I think what the problem has, has come or has become is that we just come. First, first, we want to start there is we want you just to come to church first, right? Okay, please start there. But then when you're coming on, in a, on a regular basis, which most do, I, I mean, I think if some parents a lot of credit, they come. Now, predominantly, you know, it's usually like the Sunday school season and stuff like that. But um, then they come and they don't know what they're doing there. And then they're there mainly to look forward to what? The after the church. Mm -hmm. The whole, yeah, the coffee, the fellowship, the beauty of the church is not the coffee and fellowship, which is nice afterwards. It's the it's the worship, it's the liturgy. I mean, it is so magnificent, it's so beautiful, and especially like you know, we're very blessed here. We have a wonderful choir, we have a wonderful chanters, we have a people which I've actually been seeing a little bit more week on week than more singing along. People are chanting like yeah, you're some fellows are doing this thing. and it sounds just very majestic. It's very nice and. That's the whole purpose of us all participating in the worship, that we're in it and, and working and participating with everyone else. And so it gives so much more meaning and purpose. And then I think it's also the, the peak then when then we then come out to receive Holy Communion. I mean, a lot of these parents, I know they don't. And you know why it was put, I don't know how, I really don't. Because I don't know, I didn't have a conversation with my parents say, oh, this is the only time you can take communion. But a lot of kid, parents, my age group, mid thirties and later, don't take communion. Don't take communion, not even like infrequently, but at all. No, no. I am also the same priest who I don't say I discourage, but at, on a weekly basis, communion is very sensitive because then we have to put on our mindset are we making every effort appropriately to prepare ourselves to take communion? Yeah. Because there's people I can know that come up all the time, and I'm not judging. I can't judge. That's not my point. But you, you want to encourage and make sure that they are trying the best that they can to prepare themselves because at the same time, this just isn't a, um, uh, you know, this isn't a conveyor belt. It's not just all oh, the free food or whatever. This is, it's Christ. It's, that's why when, when we come out and we say with the fear of God, with faith and love draw near, that's when we read those communion prayers beforehand. All those communion prayers, it dictates our expression to God understanding our unworthiness. He understands it. He allows us because of our unworthiness to be united with him because he loves us. He joins us together. But then we then should put into our hearts and minds, even though we're unworthy, I still will make the best effort that I can to prepare through fasting, through prayer, confessions and stuff like that, so that I can come and receive him. So that when I receive him, I feel not good. You know, it's funny. Good is a, is a childish term. I want to feel edified. I want to feel peace. I want to feel that I have Christ in me and I abide with Christ. That's why when we read the scriptures that are so powerful and are the basis of our faith, that when we do this going forward, it gives us so much more meaning to our faith, to our lives, and to the worship. That is why I do these Orthodox Studies 101. That's why with hope and joy, I've now converted it to make it more like a family night. So that after the, the kids are done with our discussion there, I have uh, young adults that are helping the kids. They take them into the atrium. They have their meal. They have a craft. And I talk to the parents. The parents need to know. These, these are my age group. This is mine, mid-30s, up to late 40s. You know what I mean? Everything else. They don't know. And it's not a bad thing that they don't know. And it's not an admonition. It's not an uh, admonishment to you, the parents. It's just, I define it as reality. Faith, faith, church is not church engagement not participation because people think that they just stand in there they're participating that's incorrect engagement and 
active worship is not an encouragement in our world. That first of all, we are taught, even in this modern world, that you know you can feel good by yourself, right? You know, you could do it yourself, this and that, whatever. That's fine. Or people then, because then that's how they how do, how have we diluted the uh, sacrament of confession? The sacrament of confession has always been something that's been very taboo, ignored, not encouraged. I mean, if anything, we should be going to confession, all of us, not often, but as a tune-up every year for our own spiritual and, yes, physical lives. Because as I know that I talk to anyone through confession, after the fact, they all feel better. Because if they want to use compare and contrast, if it feels like they've gone to a therapist or psychiatrist just to express what's up and on their minds and they've got it off their chest, Naturally, you feel better after the fact. That's why I tell people most therapists, why do you think that when they're just we're sitting there, all they do is listen? Because it's you who is expressing what you feel. And then them, that's who they are, they're just trying to guide and help. It's the exact same thing now in the spiritual manner. The problem is, do we believe in the spirituality of ourselves? First of all, do we believe that we have a soul? Do we believe the importance of the protection of the soul? And then that last part, I would say it. I've said in a few sermons, probably in this past few months, well, too, but the reality of the mortality of our lives, because it comes, it comes. And the problem is we don't think about it. The younger we are, right, we don't know. Then as we get older, then actually, as we hear the stories, it's, this is all normal, midlife crisis. Oh my God, I'm already 40, 50, what am I gonna do? And then this and that. And then I say that one, because then I talk about you guys. I, I, am, I am so envious of yourselves because many of you in your age and your wisdom live life so beautifully to the best knowledge that you can it's a reality you don't know but you still live you're not living in fear i mean my gosh if you if you put the reality of it it could be the complete opposite knowing that we don't know when our time is and it could be soon right i think we have clocks oh i'm 80 i'm 85 90 you know, who knows stuff like that we don't know when so what are you gonna do just gonna sit at home worry freak out just sit there and like oh my gosh i'm gonna count the time and then when you say, oh, I passed this day, I'm all set. No, we, we go. We do our lives. Think of the opposite now at the younger ages. The younger ages, they have so much anxiety. They have so much stress and depression where life is not even enjoyable. And there's no purpose into life. No purpose into life. That's, that's a new thing that I'm going to be expressing as well to, to my families and to my parents. Because then it's if the children need this issue. I'm sorry, the children need these attributes because, and then the parents need to have them as well to purpose. What I've witnessed with a lot of my age group, my, my generation, is we just do. We just go and do. If we do the same thing with church, we do the same thing with our lives. We work. We, we're busy. We take our children to 10,000 extracurricular events. We are nonstop. And then the day ends. And then you have to make sure that they're all set. Put the bed. And then you go from there. And then, then how, do we, how do we retreat? How do we... Uh, release from the day-to-day -day grind. Maybe we're on our phone for an hour before we go to bed. I don't know. I hope that many, maybe many couples talk to each other, try to see how they're doing. Maybe they find release by, you know, working out, um, watching some TV, reading a book and stuff like that, but not many do. And then the other problem then goes back to the original point is where's the purpose? And that's where it's tough. And that's why our faith is not in every single person actively um, cultivated. It's not actively cultivated because if you have faith and you have the belief that we have, that purpose of us with a life of Christ is something you strive to every single day. That's when we then look at our saints and we look at all these beautiful uh, martyrs and witnesses of the faith. So that's what they believe in. That's why then it was reciprocated to everyone around them. I said, how did these people do what they did? How are we going to read Paul on Corinthians? We're talking to these Gentiles, right? The Corinthians who uh, or wise, just like the Athenians, right? They believed, but they didn't know, right? It was the unknown God, but they knew that something created something and how it did everything. But how did he do this and what kind of zeal did he have? Why? And I love it. It's because people see that the Holy Spirit was a saint. He was a saint after the fact. All of these saints were saints after the fact, defined by us. They're not saints. They're sinners just like us. All the apostles. Yes, they have the Holy Spirit. You know that after the, the, the uh, you know, after the fact. Then when they were there for Pentecost, they trembled. When they had the rush of the wind and these fiery tongues above them, they were afraid. So then I say to us, why don't we live with a zeal with, to, have, to be with Christ? Because if that's in us purposefully, then we then express that around us. And how? 
Not to say, I want you to follow Christ. No, just being who you are. By loving, by being compassionate, merciful, open, understanding, witnessing, all these different things. That is what it means to have purpose and living a life with Christ. But unfortunately, our world does not, not only does it not encourage it, but it's, 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 it's ignored, it's not accepted, it's mythological, mythological because Christ and um, organized re religions are now foreign. They're not encouragements because why would you want to participate in them? We all know the black marks, right? Okay, we've heard of uh, uh, scandals, abuses, um, embezzlement, this and that. And it goes from generation to generation, right? No, there is no innocence in that capacity. I said, I understand that. I said, it's also the, that's also the reality of when the church, being that is with God, is in the same realm as humanity, which is a fallen state from God. Mm -hmm. Both are. So if that's there, don't you think that some type of corruption will just naturally infiltrate? It doesn't stay pure. Even all of us, we're all born innocent. We're all born pure. Who infiltrates us? How does a child learn hate? How does a child learn fear and anxiety? Yeah, by living and, see, and recognizing from their parents and everything else and society around them. So do we think the church is going to be immune to it? No, that's why the church is a part of it. The church then for us, what is it for us? And we look at into that pure level is that hospital uh, for us to heal our souls, right? It's that place, place, place to find peace. It's that place to find serenity, to find oneness with God. And then the second part that's simultaneous with God, with God, and that is communal worship. We cannot receive salvation without communally worshiping together. Even monastics, don't ever forget this. They, they have left this world. They worship together. Whether they worship with two people, 50, 100, where they case, they still have to worship together. So, St. Mary of Egypt, she was on the desert for 40 something years. Did she not receive Holy Communion from a clergyman to communally worship with two people? Yes. And her reason why she was out in the desert for so many years was for her own atonement that she felt because of her life that she lived beforehand. So, who are we? Are we any better? That's why I tell people it's good to pray by yourselves, but. It's even better to pray with other people because we as humans were created to be with others. We were, we were, we were not meant to be uh, solidarity or, um, or um, separated individuals. I mean, we look at us as well, too. Most people, what is something that a lot of us strive for when we're growing up and maturing? We want to find a companion. We want to find a soulmate, someone to grow old with, someone to love, someone to walk hand in hand with, whether we are blessed with a beautiful family all families are beautiful, or many children, or no children at all. You know, just having that companionship goes a long way. And that's why, you know, I know, and I talk with yourselves and others, that's why, obviously, when death hits, especially for a spouse, that's the greatest void. That's the greatest void, is that the spouse, the companion, the partner, the soulmate is just simply not there. We know they are. We believe them. We, we feel them. We recognize them. But just not having them there, probably the things that we would do, whether it's travel, sit together, watch TV together, read together, yell together, uh, whatever the case may be, we miss it. And that's what we, and you know what I tell people? That's 100% appropriate. That's correct. Because we all do. Now it's more so for the spouse compared to even the children and the grandchildren. But that's the, real, that's the reality of life. But then we then know that we have something that really unites us. And what's, that, what's that unification? Hope. And hope for something after. Because then in turn, those that have now passed and have closed their eyes, that we hope to be uh, uh, unified and to have that reunification, so to say, when we close our eyes too. And we, that's why we pray for them. That's why we do memorials, right? And then in turn, when our time comes, we pray that our kids and family will do the same for me and us. And then when we hope we're in the abode of the, of the righteous with our Lord and his uh, heavenly kingdom. But this is everything all encompassing. But everything I just told you for the last... 20, 30 minutes, we don't think about. Do you say we don't think about? On a day to day, we, once you guys go outside, you know, we do our thing, that's a movie, might strike you a little bit. You have your faith already and something like that, but think of your children, think of your grandchildren. Do you think they have these contemplations on a day to day basis? No. Most, I would say, no. I think it comes more for me anyway because I will just mm. get older. 
because that's when you have more time to contemplate and, you know, and think. And that's a good point. You have time. That, you have you have time. Right? I mean, not that I don't do stuff, but I find myself now questioning and trying to analyze and sort through and and go more towards my faith than I did before. You know, because yeah. I have the time now. Like you were saying before, when you're younger, you're so engrossed and involved and consumed with having children, raising children, working full time. You know, it's you don't sit back and say, "Hmm, let me think about my Orthodox faith. Mm. Let me think about my participation." Well, and and and, uh, and actually, 100 percent everything you said is 100 percent correct. I guess what I try to tell, what I try to encourage with the families then as well too is, it's the truth. I mean, I think that's what I've gotten in my young 34, 35 years is um, we have to sit back and smell the roses because life's going to pass them by. It passes me by. Pass I mean, I look now, I have my three children, the little one. I feel like yesterday we just, you know, we were in the hospital in the NICU while he was born premature. And now he's at four months and he's great. And, you know, he's doing strong and thank God. Well. You know what I mean? Like it's a, they're all snaps, they're all breaths. And I think that's the problem because I then tell it to the family. They said, so what's the gain of this constant running? I mean, the, and then I tell people, you know, and I tell people when my reflections is go back to, uh, go back to the funeral service. The funeral service actually says that there is, there's no tumult of the servants, no the busyness of our lives, not understanding who's rich or poor, king or soldier, righteous or sinner. No, that's not something that means anything when that time comes. At that time, you know, our hands are, 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 our hands are at the mercy of God, right? We ask him, like, you know, please be merciful. Uh, please give compassion and love me. But we, again, we don't think about it. And so what I try to encourage, what I want people to do is just to think about, not to think about death, more so to actually start thinking about life. Because when they do that, A, they might have a little fear because they'll say like, oh my gosh, my life has just been nonstop. But then I actually hope the opposite will happen. And with encouragement, we can always do that as a family and as a, and as a community. It's that we can then be supports so that they can blossom and find purpose in life. That purpose is so, so important and necessary, but it's only, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Uh, it's going to take education. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you, moms and yayas, please just keep doing what you're doing. I, uh, whether your children actively participate or not, just keep planting those seeds in them. They need it. They truly need it because. I can't tell you now, I, I am, I respectfully say that I am bearing mo a lot of your generation or older ones around that area in the same vicinity. And um, I see the pain in the kids uh, and it's just, um, uh, it's just, it's just very tough. And um, they, they truly feel lost. And where's their disconnect? It's that they felt that through their parents, maybe that they had, um, I don't know, connection with God, a connect our um, that safety net. It's a safety net. I would define as parents. I mean, and I'm living it as well too, as as many as you know, with my mother-in-law that's um, battling cancer, and I've seen her difficult state as well. You know, that's how she was, and to us, it's the most perplexing thing because our mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, she was she is the uh, she was the the support in everything. She did everything. She was active, went everywhere, did everything helped always giving and stuff like that and then now we're the ones that look into that and like you know you're at a point where you can't do much because of the um uh of the uh, illness um you feel um not weak you feel uh helpless you don't have the power yeah you you, you, you know it's hand. taken it's taken out of your hands usually when you know most of us that's why whenever we have illnesses or or difficulties our hope is that we always feel like you know we want a procedure what could be taken out and you're all good great heal and move forward now when it's something that you can't control or you don't know i mean and that's not only just with cancer i i've seen it with um lou Gehrig's disease alzheimer's dementia and stuff like that that's that's when we understand how heartbreaking and difficult life is and that's why it's so important that we teach our kids the, the, the importance of enjoying life a christ-like life because then you're making it purposeful and then, and then their children see this that's what i worry about is the second part because then, you know, with all you, with all you as parents, you don't realize it. You used to say all the time, it was always about the children, the children, the children. And it really wasn't a correct statement. You want to know why? We say it was the children, but it was more so, you know why parents were saying the children or the grandchildren? It's because of the respectful fear 
that you had as parents for the children, not to be led away. But that's because you still also would help out as best as you can. And actually, a child can decide what it wants to do as it gets older and matures, and it goes and goes. Okay, you can't force someone. I mean, this is not a you know figurative gun to someone's hand says, nope, you better stay in the faith or so help me. No, that's not correct. But but it really it's always in the determination of the parents. I really do. And I mean, you you're the ones who who have molded them, who have guided them, and you still talk with them and you teach them. Yes, in some minor capacities, you are a friend. But that parent, that parenthood that you have above all, is really is what's going to make your children and the generations to come to really blossom because then your children will know what prototypes they need to follow. My mom, my dad, and go from there. That's that's where it gets really tough with how things going in that capacity. So so that's that's kind of what we're going to be studying. Um, and then from there, we will uh, do what we need to do. And then um, we will go from there. So... Oh, I just want to send this one text message real quick. <laughs> non stop, non stop. It's the, um, well, I don't need a screen share. It's just us. No one's online right now. So that's good. We'll just record this. I can put it on our social media. They can hear our group and uh, have our good conversation. All right. So let's at least get into our, uh, our Bible study. So, uh, and as I said, the other class, we're reading Romans, which is the first epistle of Paul that we read. This one is the first book of the Corinthians. Now, we know that um, St. Paul uh, was obviously talking to the Corinthians on his third mission, missionary journey. And this is uh, probably from when he was writing it to uh, when he was in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus in, um, in the early um, Christian church was a very prominent city and one of the first large Christian cities. That's where a lot of disciples were in this area, in Ephesus. Uh, St. John, the theologian, who we celebrated his falling asleep on Sunday, he was there. Um, many of the disciples went through there because to go to like Asia Minor, to go to modern-day Constantinople, Greece, any lands of Europe, and go from there, you actually had to travel through Ephesus to then either find ports or to go north or to go west, right? So... And the Corinthians, as we understand, I like this, what it says in here about the major themes. The major themes that you're going to hear is communion with God versus communion with darkness. We are created for communion, kinonia, right? And kinonia, but not only is that communion with God, but it's with each other. And you see that that is a necessity of how we were created. Because kinonia is concretely experienced in the life of the church, which is the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? For us, when we come to partake in the sacraments of the church, we have to be in the church most of the time to receive them. Yes, there's uh, there's um, experiences that we receive sacraments outside the church, but it's meant to be in the house of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. But communion is not automatic. We pursue it. How about that one? We pursue it. It's not just going to come to us or say, oh, I am in communion with someone or in this capacity. No, we have to work for it. And while we may cooperate with evil, we are created to cooperate with God and with each other. The sub-themes, factionalism, civil lawsuits, sexual immorality, meat sacrifice to idols, Eucharistic theolo theology and practice, spiritual gifts, and the resurrection of life. So let's read a little about the background, then we'll actually start reading. The background. So there were a number of problems with the Corinthian church, which Paul responds to it in his letters. Again, I said that the, the epistles are all conversations of Paul with the early churches the early Christians trying to set guidelines and directions for their people to grow and blossom with their uh, uh, relationship with God. And again, it's like us, even modern day, we're in 2021 and we have similar issues or similar conversations with our hierarchy or with each other that I think is important for us to understand because it just shows how relatable the church is even 2000 years later. Many Corinthian Christians have broken into several factions based on improper loyalty the particular Christian leaders. Hmm, what a coincidence. That still happens today. That's why we have thousands of denominations of Christianity. Doctrin, doctrinal, yeah, doctrinal speculations. Doctrinal speculations. Excellent. That's great too, because think about that. All the denominations of Christianity that have separated from the church, right, have branched off, as they say. Um, that's so funny. Comes from the word Protestant, to protest. In other words, it's in defiance of whatever was expressed originally. 
So it's an offshoot. And so then in turn, you have once Protestantism has existed, it then in turn has allowed the doorway to be open for any contemplation or manipulation of the faith and the scriptures to then ensue. That is something very tough. That's why I hear so many things in so many different ways about Christianity. It, it actually is perplexing to say, well, so what do I believe? Why do you think us Orthodox Christians not waver, but suffer in the essence of how to express who I am as an Orthodox Christian? Or then in turn are embarrassed and shame because they don't know how to express it. And that's very tough because we know all these other people, they'll say, I go to this church, I go to this church, I go to this one, really the case would be, uh, I'm, uh, I'm this denomination of Christianity. I'm not practicing, but I'm not, uh, I'm not agnostic. And then you get all these other definitions as well, too. You've got atheists, you've got agnostic, you've got um, all these different types of beliefs. And they're like, and then us people then were like, well, you know what, maybe I'm in one of those umbrellas, or maybe I'm one of those categories, I said what puts you what gives you that determination or why do you feel that way and again it, it can always sway day by day but when we understand the reality of the difficulties that existed 2000 years ago and the difficulties we exist today the sad thing is the faith because of the simplicity of life back then not having technology the the tumults that exist in our modern day world economies works and everything else faith was a clear importance in everyone's lives whether they were pagans that was a faith uh they were atheists right there were uh there were obviously the jews there were obviously other ones that believed in god such as the samaritans whatever but they were offshoots or not considered to be of the chosen people of the tribe of israel right and who am i talking about those are like the samaritans those are like the um the gentiles right um and all these other ones and then you naturally don't forget this isn't just some there were also the people who existed still in india people that existed in modern day china and throughout the whole world even in africa and they believed something or they understood something in some capacity but then when when we bring in christ into this fold and we're bringing his light into the world then we're seeing fulfillment then we're seeing ah true completion are saying ah this is god that's why they become as him being the one true god father son and holy spirit but now modern day we don't even have these discussions. Why don't we have these discussions modern day with other denominations or other faiths? Because the problem is none of, you know what it is? It's, um, that's why they say, you know, in, in modern conversation, you don't talk about politics or religion, right? Because politics is uh, divisive. We know that. And religion, it's actually the same thing because every person thinks their religion is right. And so if I say that I'm a Greek Orthodox and then they'll be like, oh, okay, so what do you believe? And then you tell them, and like, okay, and then you start seeing the similarities, yes. But then the hardest part is when you actually finally get down, so let's just say you scrape all the coverings off, right? And you get down to the bare bones or whatever, then you say that, you know, we are the one true faith, and this we stem from the apostles and from Christ himself in the apostolic succession. You then get a, an odd reaction. Either A, they think you're lying, or then B, then they think that you're prideful. And then you're like, great, so now what? And so that's why it's such a sensitive time because uh, we have understand that as well too, is that's what people assume. I said this to the parents yesterday. The, the word assume is probably, I think, the most vile word that exists in the English language. Why? Because when you assume something about someone, you might find out that it's the complete opposite and then you're the one with the dirt in the face, right? And then an assumption also then also relates to judgment. Because if you assume that about someone, whether it's a stereotype and it's in uh, belief or whatever the case may be, and they don't believe that, but you just see them, then what have you done? Then you're the one that's judging. You're the one that's critiquing and clearly assumed wrong. That's why our Lord tells us not to assume or to judge. More importantly, he tells us to know them and to love them. And so that's why we then have to, how do you express your faith with love? And that's where he tells us, like God tells us, he's like, not to be like the scribes and the hypocrites, who would openly, like, you know, verses of the law in the Old Testament say, what does that mean? Who cares? And that's why, like, I look at modern day, that's where the televangelists and, you know, the Joel Olsteins, whatever, they, they'll take stuff out of context. They'll take scriptures and stuff like that. But it's all just to give a, a positive feeling. You know, oh, I feel good. I said the scripture does that already. But my faith is actually what makes me not feel good, 
but allows me to then persevere through the day-to-day -day grind that is life and know that there are days of beauty and there are days of difficulty. And so when I tell people, when I hear this stuff and they say all these positive vibes or whatever, which is not wrong, don't get me, it's not wrong, but it's, it has a manipulation to it because not everything is rosy. And did you actually notice our church would like to express the opposite of it? With God, everything already has that beauty and positivity. That's not reality. So all that we are teaching now is an incorrect reality. How can you do It's like, you know what it is? It's a drug form of Christianity. It's a high. Here is a nice little meme. You know what a meme is? It's those things on like social media where there's like three lines and it's just like some context. Oh, that's nice. That feels good. I like that. Thank you. It's like you got like a booster shot of Christ. Oh, I feel good. And then after 15 minutes, it drops back down. That's a high. Drugs. Same thing that drugs do for people. When they use marijuana, when they drink, when we do anything, or when we gamble, we win some, oh, I feel so good. And then you back down. I got to win more, right? You got to do that. It's the same thing with that you can do with our faith. Because it's not reality. What is not the reality is that understanding with our, our Lord, the scriptures and everything else, show that really life is simply one thing. It's a struggle. It's a struggle, but what's so powerful about a struggle that there's beauty in struggle. Can you guys tell me where you can find beauty in struggle? Beauty in struggle. Think about this. But you know how I would use this context on to help you? Beauty in struggle. Think of your own lives. I know your lives were not rosy. You're going to say, what's rosy? So yes, no lives are rosy. But where is the beauty in struggle? I think it's, it's growth. It's what happens to you as you go through this. Struggle. Yes, yes. I took care of both my parents before they passed away, and it was very difficult, but I think it helped me immensely mm. as, you know, as a person to grow, to develop, to develop some characteristics that I didn't have before. Mm. And it made me stronger, mm. much stronger than I was before. I look back on that now and I go, Seriously? Can I do all of that? Can I really go through all of that? That's yourself. I mean, I know obviously with uh with your husband as well too, and with your family, but uh, what what did you want to say? Oh no, I it did strike to me because it was the first marriage. Mm. And and I looked back and I said, How did I do that? But it did make me stronger. And with the struggle though, it's getting through it and it's Now I'm I'm speaking to wisdom in front of me because you 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 are you are and you have lived long, beautiful, and incredible lives. That is the thing that we're trying to instill in our modern generation through our faith. That it's okay to struggle because through struggle, you're gonna see a lot of beauty as well, too. And even Christ says, even Paul says, and all the saints, that through your struggles, how you attain your your crown of the heavenly kingdom, your cross that you bear. Everyone always use everyone thinks that whenever we hear the term. When Christ says to deny yourselves, pick up your cross and follow me, that it's a burden. No, that's also then representing you taking your life as well, too. You pick up your life and follow him. That means you are now dedicating your life to Christ. With whatever comes with you, negative baggage, positive baggage, anything that is encompassed in that. And it's not a burden. It's not, oh, we all have a cross to bear. Christ's cross, though, opened heaven to us. Was it a burden to him? Was it a burden to him? The short answer really is no. He did it willingly. If it was a burden to him, really, being that he's God, do you think he actually should have done it? No. I said to the kids, I said, why did he do it? And the kids answered yesterday correctly, because he loves us. He didn't have to, but he did it because he loves us. So the cross was not a burden to us in humanity and knowing the effort and the struggle of my God to actually being physically to lift up this wood that's going to carry my weight or hold my weight, and then me physically being pierced on it. Yes. That is incredibly painful. I can't even fathom it. But was that a burden to Christ? And the answer is no, because he then made from that negative, humiliating sign that was people that have been crucified into the positive that is to open heaven and to show us true love. We now witness them what's our own cross and understand that we all have one. We all have one. And that we pick it up to follow me with Christ. And so then that's why there is so much beauty in struggle. Because through struggle, you witness strength, accomplishment, achievements, 
perseverance, and then you also have faith, where then all of this has become purposeful and all-encompassing compared to the opposite, where if there's one, I've said it before, but if there's one detriment that I feel generations before us have done in our, our, in our world, in our history, in our society, is that we've always stated that we want to make, we always want to give um, a better life to our children, okay? A better life to our children. And I feel that that is something that's not in good context. Why? Because the life that we are currently living, first of all, is a blessing and miracle by God. And secondly, it has its own type of beauty. Beauty is not defined in one single term. Beauty can also be in the eye of the beholder, where you have people that have nothing and have a lot of joy and beauty and the simple stuff in life. You have people who have everything and find no beauty in anything whatsoever. So then it goes back to us. Every life that you live is beautiful in its own correct, unique way. That must be instilled and taught to our families now so that when our children grow, they can understand that it's good to have some sort of struggle and difficulties so that they can persevere. That's what's going to make them grow and become better people and better Orthodox Christians as they get older. Because if we just, and you know this, this is the truth. We, and our own parents said to us, if you spoon feed, you coddle and take care of them all the time. Yes, there's times that we, we're compassionate and loving. We know, we, we feel for them as well too. If you do it all the time, I said, Who's, who are you benefiting? But they're not getting the benefit. Because then in turn, yeah, we define as being spoiled, right? The Greek term, kakomati, many, and stuff like that. But it's not good. Because then in turn, when, when the time comes, what you said earlier, if someone passes, right? The other one passes. What are they done? They're left feeble, weak, and not knowing what to do with the new struggle of life without you physically being here. Now, somehow they have a great strength with their faith and they can show the unification, but it's such a rare, rare occurrence that it never happens that way. So it goes back to the aspect of us expressing our faith and not misinterpreting and uh, misunderstanding um, our Christian beliefs. So Aaron is teaching thrive in Corinth, particularly that of Gnostic variety, okay? Moral failure. The Corinthian church, free from persecution, became spiritually weak and succumbed to the moral failure the city was famous for. Wow, what a coincidence. That's modern day society. We have no persecution. So technically right now, there's no persecution of our faith. We're in the United States. You can freeze your foot, do what you want. But what this is, we became spiritually weak. Do you feel that we're spiritually weak currently? Yes. If someone says no, I would highly encourage them to tell me how they think we're not. Uh, because, and it's not, this is not, again, it's not judgment. It's just honest. Remember this, you have to be honest as well, too. We have to be honest with ourselves. We are spiritually weak because we have everything that we need that in turn, we don't turn to God on a daily continuous basis. What do we do? I said this, we all know what this is the correct answer. We turn to God in times of fear and the need, right? Worry, pain, illness, calamities, destruction, stuff like that. That's what we turn on. And then here it says, um, and succumb to the moral failure the city was famous for. So we have moral failure modern day as well, too. Last year, and I was very honest, uh, the injustice when we saw with the um, George Floyd uh, situation, everything else, um, what the only thing that took me the worst back was the attitude of everyone saying that that was the tipping point. I said, why did it, why did it have to take hundreds of years, even thousands, right, to understand the failure of humanity in a judgmental role because inju injustice and racism always was in a superiority, white over black, uh, rich over poor, and stuff like that. So I had to wait till 2020 to see a black man uh, being obviously arrested, but having a policeman on him for over nine minutes, where then the person lost lost his breath and then unfortunately lost his life to then realize the injustice in the world i said it really took that i i actually took that as a as a step as a slap more to our face as humanity because why 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 did we have to wait for that moment all these other times no one expressed anything i mean what happened 50 years ago in the 60s and even with the 50s and obviously even the early 70s with um um the um Equal rights movement, even before that. First of all, there was no women rights. And then, then, we, then that was one step. And then for then for equal rights for uh, 
anyone, male, female, black or white. And then now we have new ones. Yeah, they talk about um, with homosexuality and for equal rights for marriage and stuff like that. That's fine. Huh? But why why did that have to be? Why did that have to? Why do we have to wait up to a moment like that? I'm like, this has existed always. That's what frustrates me. Because then everyone then obviously went into an uproar and destroyed everything. And then they were making uh, attitudes again of, I will define as extremes. These are defined as extremisms, where then they make a movement or define what we call Black Lives Matters and all this stuff as well, too. Fine. But I, I get, I get, conflicted in those matters because it's not that i not it's not that i don't agree with black lives matters i've always thought black lives matter so who doesn't then fine i know that there are people that believe that but then the problem in life is you can't choose whose life matters after it has to and that's that goes back to fundamental belief a as a christian and be as a human. I'm sorry. So when we're now defining these, that actually should show the repulsiveness as we are as a humanity and society. That's why I'm going back into the poor morale and the morality that is weak. We have not changed in nearly 2,000 years, even with early Corinthian cities and stuff like that. That's scary. That's scary. Even with technology. No, no. We, uh, it think, seems, think, um, Avenues might seem quiet, right? Oh, everything seems peaceful, but it's just because it doesn't hit home for us. Whether you know we're in the suburbs, whether we're in the city, stuff like that, whatever the case would be, it always exists. It always exists. And now look, I go back to another part too. Go back to Afghanistan. We're there for 20 years. We're out. Taliban come in. You know, nothing's changed. There, they have a they have a very very extremist attitude. Back to their um, Islamic law. Uh, women's rights removed. Yeah, I mean, it's back. It's back to you know stuff like that. So, where then that also has to be a reality too to realize that again, what we said originally, you can't change or force people to do what you believe. And I think that's why so many ideologies and extremist views fail. Why do Christianity has persevered for over two thousand years? And the nature of the church has existed always since the beginning of time. And it's, it's, it's grown more purely when it wasn't forced upon. Why? Why do you think it's, why do you think it's succeeded in that manner when it was not forced upon? Because people say the height of Christianity was in the, the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, but it was also an empire that still had wars, still conquered cities, still enforce Christianity, but look at the Crusades. The Crusades were probably the most vile types of wars that ever existed. Okay. Uh, they were, yeah, there was no positive, it was all in the name of Christ? I don't think so. So why is the, why has it been that the church has been able to blossom at times when it's not forced upon or Go back to this, go back to Christ and go back to the early church. Why was it like fire? I mean, we're talking about early Christianity now, 50 AD, up to nearly, even the, you know, there were three great persecutions until Constantine came into power, power and gave the edict in which that Christianity was not to be persecuted anymore throughout the empire. Think about that. Those three persecutions were hundreds of thousands of Christians were martyred in time spans, but they still persevered. Why? Or it progressed and it still blossomed like fire, mind you. Like these people, all, and we're talking about different. You're talking about from a Corinthian to a Roman, even though similarities, two differences. Corinthian to a Jew, big difference. Why well, do you think when even titles that neither Greek nor Jew nor this nor that? They're so different from each other, yet it's still it's still engulfed everything that was going on. How is that possible? Uh, the Christian faith. Well, then ask yourselves. Mm. Which, which which excellent which was in is foreign Lo and not and not love that we think remember what is love defined by us again we're struggling as adults it's intimacy it's uh, physical um uh possessive i love this i love that uh it's always in those terms 
Christ-like love is is a is a livelihood. It's a it's a it's, it's you you live it, you breathe it, and you express it. So then, anyone around you re recognize that and see that through your actions and person. You don't say "I love you." You don't need to, because by how you are, you are showing love to them, and that's foreign. Because if I say that to the person, they'll be like, "Oh, you love me." No, no, they can't love me. That's why I said it Sunday. I like you. I tolerate you. I guess I can handle you. Right? That's how we act with each other. But if it's you know, we then go to the spouse level. When you go to the family level, right? In those intimate areas, I say I love you. But in a bigger picture, no, I can't do that. In a bigger picture, no, because you know we have definitions of what love is, and that's actually incorrect. That's incorrect because those same definitions of what love is actually still date back to our our predecessors, our forefathers, because that's how they did the same thing as well too. But then the problem that I tell people is, I almost give I give some passes to the previous generations because they might not have known better. Not everyone had printing presses. Not everyone had iPads, phones, this, that. We have everything. We are the world of the knowledge. We're the world of everything. We have it. You want it, you can get it now. So why can't we have love and show love? Real love. Again, on Sunday, I didn't say it's Sunday. I, it's not that I don't like. I just get very distaste that whenever I see the signs on people's lawns that say science is science, love is love, and this and that, black is this or whatever, I support black lives matter. I says, and it, it even states, I believe, or this household believes. Okay. And then I tell people, why does it have to be categorized? Should not all of this be under a universal umbrella of my love that I first have with God and then I have with everyone? Do I seriously have to break everything down so someone knows? I actually find that kind of upsetting and disturbing. Is that how bad our world is? That if I don't tell you how I feel, then you're going to assume the worst about me? Which the answer is yes. I am a priest, Greek Orthodox. Oh, okay. So let's not put the game of assumption. He's probably conservative. He has a beard. Oh, he might be monastic. Two, he wears a robe. Maybe, if I'm not Greek, he might look like he's an Arab. I don't know. Uh, Taliban. Oh, yeah. uh, three, um, he... Uh, he um, I'm trying to think of like some other things. Oh, he's a priest. So I have friends. I, I do. I have friends and I have family that are uh, homosexual. Other people, they don't know me, will say, oh, he must be, he must hate me, right? He must not want me. Um, he's Greek. He probably, uh, he's probably racist against Blacks and other denominations. He clearly hates Turkish people, right? Let's put the whole assumptions and go down the list. And that's the reality. That is how we, we see everyone in this world. Now, the best part is our world, especially in the United States, we're a melting pot, all of us. Most of us have mixed marriages, unique families, not all of us from Greece and from this quote, you know, what are the kids we, what are the kids we? So um, how does that relate then? Hmm? How do you define that person? Well, they're Hispanic, half Hispanic, but they're also half American. So then what's an American? What's an American? And the problem is an American is everything, right? But then the problem is we're not expressing what a true America should be because we've been given ideals and we've given Bill of Rights, Constitution, stuff like that. And all of it actually with respect, even our, our, our founding father started this stuff, it was under an assumption, obviously of religious freedom. That's why they left England in the first place. And then in turn, they also had that as a basis foundationally, not only with, with ancient Greece and democracy and all these things, but obviously with the premise of God and openness to each other, right? That's why we have the Bill of Rights and all this stuff. So. Why then can we not show love and have it universally? And because the real answer is we don't know what love is. We don't know what it means to love someone unconditionally because the one who does that unconditionally is God. And we choose who or what we want to love. I love my spouse. I love my family. But even that, I know people who, who hate their own children. You know, like legit, I'm talking about like despise. Like, I've had some extremes where someone will say, I know it sounds terrible, but they'll be like, uh, you know, sometimes I wish they weren't even born. I'm like, whoa, hold on, hold on. So then that's that line there. So if I can't even love general people, so then I go to the example, how can you hate your own and then still say you love others? Is that possible? Think of, look, you just see this image I made? How can you do that when if the apple is rotten at the core, 
and stay on the outside. That's why it doesn't work. You can't just do that. That's why the saints and the faith and all the holiness that exists with our with the uh, with the um, the martyrs and the witnesses of the faith showed that you have to rise above. And I always throw one example out just for people to think about. It's the example of um, Saint um, Saint Dionysius of Zacchaeus. So I don't know if you guys know his story of uh, how of how he obviously was. Yes, he was very saintly, but the most powerful story about him was that obviously when he was at his monastery, I believe it was on the island of Zakynthos where he was at for, I think he was also Bishop of Aegina, that there was a man who was banging on the door of the monastery and it was raining, it was a downpour and this man was crying. He's like, you know, please take me in, I'm running away. Uh, the authorities are trying to get me and stuff like that. Okay, so Dionysius not knowing this guy just brings him in where the case would be. He finds out that earlier his brother, St. Dionysius' brother was murdered, okay? And that uh, the authorities were looking for this guy who was described by the same person who just came into Dionysius' monastery. So Dionysius then sat back and says, what do I do? Do I throw this guy to the, uh, to the um, authorities and have him arrested? Do I kill him myself because he's taking away my brother's life? Or well, then he obviously took number three, which was he not only kept him there, but then he asked them and the man not only confessed what he did, but asked for forgiveness from Dionysius. Whoa. And what did Dionysius do? He forgave him, and he actually allowed him to stay in his monastery. You know what it is to have that same person who killed your own brother, took your own brother's life, I mean, or any of your family members' lives and to be in that same presence? All of us, we think of uh, judgment right away. You know, hang him, you know, uh, chair, everything, you know, finish it. Don't even think about it. So, uh, lock the key and, uh, you know, throw it out. You know, lock the door and throw the key out. It's no second guess. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, oh, you know, this is right and that's wrong. No, but it just shows... How the saints rise above. We look left and right in our world. You either choose right or left. You either choose conservative or liberal. You choose this or that. And I think what the problem is, what our Lord is telling us to do is we're supposed to look above and rise above. We're above that. For yourselves as Christians, you have to be above this. You can't be one-sided. You have to be above it. And when I say above it, above it, not judgmentally. Above it spiritually and all-encompassing. Because... We gain nothing by choosing one side. I might, I might agree with one side, but that's in one conversation. Where at the same time, you know, that's what always frustrates me with politics. You, they, they state you have to be on one side. So something comes up for debate. You then have to toe the line. And then if your party was going to choose this one side, you have to be with it. Or then in turn, you are against us. And they give you all these new these nicknames, scapegoat, blah, 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 this and that, turncoat, all this stuff. Then if you if the other side says something and you might agree with them, oh, now you're flip-flopping. Now you're on the other side. And I think that's bad because it's, con it's created a world of division where reality, we have to actually do everything as we do even like in the church and with our faith by case by case. Do we not realize that? That every single one of you does not have one uniform judgment or one uniform measure of necessity for forgiveness. So when you come to confession, I guarantee you, I do not say the exact same thing to every single one of you because each one of you is unique and different. So you're going to confess something. It's going to be different than what the previous person said. So then in turn, I wouldn't say, oh, well, that's not what the other person said. So no, you got to do this. Or even in the church. Even though everything is uniform and we all follow and we do the same things, every one of us are different. Some of us have a uniqueness. Some of us pray a little bit more differently. Some pray more, some pray less. But we're still all under the, uh, the uh, guidance and one body of God. And I don't think we realize that because in a turn, we go back to the avengers. What divides us? What divides us? We said before, let's give an example. We're titled Greek Orthodox Church. Well, us being defined as Greek, that's one division, right? Because if you're not Greek, then you're not welcome here. Which is kind of comical that I've actually heard that before. I said, so because you're not Greek, you're not welcome here? That's not true. That's assumed. But then look at all the other churches. Antiochian Orthodox Church. Well, I'm not Antiochian. People don't even know what Antiochian means. First of all, I said it's Antioch. What's Antioch? Okay. Then you define like, all oh, those are the Arab Orthodox. Oh, well, I'm not Arabic. Okay, well, that's fine. Yes? I'll be there in like a couple minutes. Um, uh, all those things, and it all brings divisions. But 
it goes back to what we always try to talk about Corinthians. And that is that even in Paul's time, and even to us 2,000 years later, we are dealing with the exact same situation that he is. Let's let's at least start here. Let's try to get a little of uh, chapter one done, and then we'll uh, move over there. We'll only do the first page. We'll go to about verse, I'll get to verse 12, and then we'll finish from there, okay? All right, the greeting. Um, who would like to start the greeting? Best, why don't you uh, uh, start with uh, verse one, chapter one. Okay. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Sosthenes? Is that how pronounce it? Sosthenes, yes. Sosthenes, our brother. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified and sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both there and ours. Thanksgiving for God's grace of Corinth. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you, so that you come short to know him, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By whom we were called into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Very good. So we see right here, obviously, with his uh, his welcoming openness, you know, telling that he is an apostle of Jesus, and he's speaking to his brother, Sosthenes, his brother being a fellow Christian. Like that's when I say, uh, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. It says, now talking to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So we're all called to be saints, not just because we're sanctified in Christ Jesus. But with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ, they're both theirs and ours. And that's important because thanksgiving for God's grace at Corinth. And that's important too, because here, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That peace, remember, Christ, even himself, wherever he went, brought peace. It says, peace be with you all. Peace be unto you. And then we, we respond with your spirit. And that peace only comes with Christ. I even said to the children yesterday, I said, the, the cross was fun. It was like an oxymoron. I said, the cross is a weapon. Can anyone tell me what type of weapon it is? And the children were like, once I was kind of cute, like a sword. Was this? I said, no, because the cross is not a, a hurtful weapon. I said, it does the opposite. And they're like, wow. 